Good afternoon. I am Tracy Waite from the Bureau's events management team. I will go over some logistics for WebEx before we begin. The link for closed captioning will be placed in the chat box. The chat box is located near the bottom of the WebEx window. This event is being live streamed. The link to the live stream will also be placed in the chat box. If you wish to switch to view the live stream, please click on that link. Whether you have logged into the WebEx platform or are viewing the live stream via YouTube, this event is listen only for all attendees. This event is being recorded. The recording will be made available to the public at a later date. Now I will turn this event over to Alicia Criado Hampshire from the Bureau's Office of Public Engagement. Thank you, Tracy. Hello, and welcome to the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau's virtual appraisal bias event. Again, my name is Alicia Criado Hampshire, and I'm the Acting Staff Director for the Section for Public Engagement at the CFPB. Today's event will feature two presentations by Michael Neal of the Urban Institute and Jim Park with the Appraisal Subcommittee of the Federal Financial Institutions Examinations Council, both of whom are experts on this issue. These presentations will be followed by a federal agency panel discussion focusing on the agency's perspectives on appraisal bias. Our agency partners in attendance include Michael Shu, Acting Comptroller of the Currency, who will be joining us a bit later, Todd Harper, Chairman of the National Credit Union Administration, and current Chairman of the FFIEC. Alana McCargo, Senior Advisor for Housing Finance at the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development, and Jim Park, uh, again, who I previously mentioned, is the Executive Director of the Appraisal Subcommittee of the FFIEC. Following the panel, uh, we will have a roundtable discussion on the topic at hand with civil rights and fair lending groups, consumer advocates, and researchers. I'm now proud to introduce the CFPB's Acting Director, Dave Wagio, who will provide opening remarks. Dave Wagio was announced as the Acting Director of the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau by President Biden on January 20th, 2021. Having been with the Bureau since 2012, Acting Director Wagio has served many roles at the Bureau, including Acting Chief of Staff, Lead for Talent Acquisition, and most recently as the Bureau's Chief Strategy Officer. During his tenure, Acting Director Wagio has focused on taking all available measures to protect consumers, particularly vulnerable ones negatively affected by the pandemic, and has worked to utilize the tools of the Bureau to tackle racial disparities and inequalities laid there by the pandemic. Acting Director Wagio, you now have the floor. Great, many thanks, Alicia. And good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us on this roundtable discussion addressing home appraisal bias, an emerging issue that the Appraisal Institute, a prof professional association representing home appraisers, has acknowledged as a growing problem in the industry. Just how egregious can this problem be? Well, you needn't look far. Take the recent example of one black couple in San Francisco who had their home appraised after investing $400,000 in renovations. Their first appraisal of the newly renovated home, with the appraiser viewing the couple's family pictures in plain sight, came in only $100,000 above the home pre-renovation price, or $300,000 less than the cost of the renovations. After the couple successfully got their lender to agree to a second appraisal, they took out all of their family pictures and agreed to have their white friends put their pictures in the home to convey white home ownership. The second appraisal came in $500,000 higher than the first appraisal did just weeks before. This may be an extreme example, but it underscores the potential for unconscious bias to come into play when valuing a home based on factors that have nothing to do with home valuation. Home appraisals are by their very nature imprecise, and no one is arguing there can't be reasonable differences of professional opinion when valuing the worth of a home. But when it comes to appraising homes located in communities of color, metrics such as the quality of building materials, location, or curb appeal should not run secondary to the prevailing skin color of the neighborhood. When a home receives an underappraisal, it has a domino effect on the homeowner and on the surrounding community. The homeowner will have more difficulty securing favorable mortgage rates for refinancing. The household suffers a significant loss in net worth, 
and the neighborhood comparables are lower, and on and on. Earlier this month, President Biden announced a new interagency initiative to address inequity in home appraisals, with the Department of Housing and Urban Development, HUD, leading the effort. The new initiative will seek to utilize the many levers at the federal government's disposal, including potential enforcement under fair housing laws, regulatory action, and development of standards and guidance in close partnership with industry and state and local governments to root out discrimination in the appraisal and home buying process. As acting director, I have prioritized CFPB resources to focus the agency's view on addressing long-standing racial inequities in the financial marketplace. This country is in the middle of a long overdue conversation about race and practices and policies of the financial services industry that have both caused and exacerbated racial inequality continue to persist. Today, we are going to explore the topic of home appraisal bias in detail. We will have a couple of experts to discuss their research on the issue, followed by a panel of federal agency partners who will provide more background and their agency's perspective on appraisal bias. Following the panel, we will have a roundtable discussion with civil rights leaders, consumer advocates, and housing policy researchers to discuss this topic and address possible remedies. With that backdrop, I'll now hand off the event to my colleague, Alicia, who will introduce our researchers on this topic. Over to you, Alicia. Great, thank you so much for your remarks, Acting Director. I would now like to introduce our presenters, Michael Neal and Jim Park. Michael Neal is a Senior Research Associate in the Housing Finance Policy Center at the Urban Institute. Previously, he worked at Fannie Mae, where he was a Director of Economics in the Economic and Strategic Research Division. As a housing economist, he has an in-depth knowledge of housing market trends and has provided expert analysis and commentary on housing. And following Michael Neal's presentation, we'll hear from Jim Park, who has served as the executive director of the FFIC appraisal sub subcommittee since 2009. Mr. Park has over 23 years of appraisal and mortgage banking experience. As the executive director of the appraisal subcommittee or ASC, he is the senior staff person responsible for the day-to-day -day ASC operations and staff. Mr. Park is responsible for implementing ASC policies, overseeing its programs and budget, developing recommendations to the ASC members, and representing the ASC before state appraisal regulatory officials, federal regulatory officials, and various appraisal industry groups. And with that, I'll now turn it over to Michael Neal to discuss his work on automated valuation models. Thank you very much, Alicia. Um, it's, uh, it's a pleasure to be with everyone this afternoon. Um, again, my name is Michael Neal, uh, again, a researcher at the Urban Institute. Um, and I'm pleased to share uh, the work that we have done uh, looking at automated valuation models or AVMs um, and how they can disproportionately uh, affect majority black neighborhoods. <clears throat> uh, turning to the next slide, uh, <clears throat> Sorry, excuse me. Yep, thank you. Uh, turning to the next slide, uh, what we see here uh, is a little bit of background. Um, you know, the major point here is that AVMs um, have uh, generally gained greater interest um, as a substitute for um, and to a degree as a complement to uh, in person appraisals. Um, and I think that this reflects uh, the role that in-person appraisals uh, have played, um, whether uh, it's research documenting, um, its contribution to the housing bust in the Great Recession, um, its role in perpetuating uh, racial inequality, um, as well as uh, public policy's concern um, about its role in perpetuating the pandemic. Um, but at the same time, uh, I think that this kind of work and AVMs uh, more generally um, play a role uh, in the research surrounding financial technology um, and the role that financial technology as a tool can play um, in eliminating or significantly reducing racial disparities. The next slide illustrates uh, just some methodology uh, that I want to walk you through um, that we went through in our research. Um, we identified or created three measurements of AVM inaccuracy. The first one is uh, the direction of inaccuracy. 
Uh, the second one is the magnitude of inaccuracy. Um, and let me motivate your intuition with this example. Suppose there are two homes, um, and on the first home, uh, the AVM undervalues uh, the home by $10,000. Um, and say in the second home, the AVM overvalues the home by $10,000. Um, then the direction of inaccuracy, which is what we think of when we say the word bias, um, would be zero. That is, the first home was $10,000 under the true value, the second home was $10,000 above, um, and so on average, uh, bias is zero. Um, but the magnitude of inaccuracy would be $10,000. And that is, if, we're not, if, we, if we get rid of or we exclude uh, the direction, um, and just look at how far off AVMs are relative to some measure of the value of the home, um, then that gives us $10,000. It's just off by $10,000. Um, and then the third one is the percentage, percentage magnitude of inaccuracy, which takes the magnitude and scales it by the underlying value of the home. In our research, we perform regression analysis um, to help us to explain AVM inaccuracy in majority black neighborhoods relative to majority white neighborhoods. And finally, we focused on uh, the areas of Atlanta, of Memphis, and Washington, DC. In this presentation, I'm going to show you the charts uh, related to Atlanta and Memphis. Um, but if you go to our research, uh, we have the charts related to Washington, DC there as well. So the next slide starts us off with looking at the trends uh, with respect uh, to bias or the direction of inaccuracy. And the evidence from our research indicates uh, little, um, little, li little perspective of bias either in Atlanta or in Memphis. Um, and that is that both the blue line and the white line, the blue line being representing majority black neighborhoods, the yellow line representing majority white neighborhoods are generally near zero uh, over time, um, uh, at least since 2005 in Atlanta. Um, but the second part uh, is that uh, majority black neighborhoods, AVMs do not appear to systematically produce bias in majority black neighborhoods relative to majority white neighborhoods. That is that the blue line is sometimes above the yellow line, sometimes below the, uh, the yellow line, but generally in concert with the yellow line through time for both Atlanta and uh, the Memphis area. But turning to the next slide, uh, where we begin to look at the magnitude of inaccuracy, um, we see a bit of a surprising result. Um, again, the magnitude of inaccuracy is we're not interested in the direction of bias, whether it's systematically under or overvaluing, overvaluing a home, just how far off is it, whether to the upside or to the downside. And what we see is that, in fact, uh, the magnitude of inaccuracy, of AVM inaccuracy, is actually greater, according to our analysis, in majority white neighborhoods relative to majority black neighborhoods. And this is generally systematic. That is that it is taking place across both of these areas through much of time. But then the next slide takes the magnitude of inaccuracy and scales it by the underlying home value, or the underlying sales price, taking into account the fact that in majority of white neighborhoods, home values are significantly greater than those in majority black neighborhoods. And when we take into account this difference in home values, what we see is that the percent magnitude of inaccuracy is greater in majority black neighborhoods relative to majority white neighborhoods. So what I think we're picking up is an interaction effect. And that is the conditions and the dynamics that lead to the undervaluation of homes, whether it's through economics or whether it's through the history of systemic racism, is exaggerating the, the magnitude of error coming from AVMs. Turning to the next slide, uh, we then sought to explain uh, this percent magnitude of error through regression analysis, a key tool that, you, that those uh, of us in the research and the economics field used to quantify the main contributors to, uh, a particular, to a particular variable. In this case, it's the percent magnitude of inaccuracy. The variables that we included, which are in our report, um, were in four general buckets. The first one is generalized property conditions around the year of the home and the home value distribution. The second were neighborhood conditions. 
the third turnover rate, and the fourth the majority race of the neighborhood. I want to focus on the bottom two. First, we found, in fact, that the turnover rate, which is the number of sales relative to the housing stock, uh, was actually greater in majority black neighborhoods relative to majority white neighborhoods. Greater turnover does increase uh, AVM accuracy. Uh, but, at, but that increase was more than offset by the disparities with respect to the way that we measured property differences, neighborhood conditions, as well as the majority race of the neighborhood. And this was surprising, the fact that the majority race of the neighborhood was what we call statistically significant. It was surprising because an AVM should not be aware of the majority race of the neighborhood. But in fact, we saw, we found that it did statistically contribute to the difference in the percent magnitude of inaccuracy in majority black neighborhoods relative to majority white neighborhoods. The next slide offers some policy recommendations. We cite three, but are open to discussing more. The first one are ways in which we can encourage direct investment flowing to majority black communities, particularly through black banks and other CDFIs. The second one is supporting households seeking to purchase distressed sales for use as a primary residence. And the third one is encouraging modelers to continue identifying other variables that could be included in their AVMs and could help reduce the magnitude of inaccuracy in majority black neighborhoods. So where should the research go next? The next slide offers two, well, two potential opportunities. The first one is more precisely and directly controlling for property conditions. While we did that with the year built and the, and the distribution of house prices, data that can actually help us to more specifically differentiate, say, the roof condition relative in one home relative to that of another may help to explain the, disparate, the disparities in the percent magnitude of inaccuracy. Um, and the second uh, potential area of research um, ex is examining one side of inaccuracy, that is too low uh, 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 AVM estimates. It's possible that a too low estimate could threaten uh, a home purchase. Um, and this has implications for the racial home ownership rate gap. And so finally, I just want to leave you with my contact information um, and let you know uh, that we will certainly be happy um, to discuss uh, this topic. Um, please feel free to email us, uh, both myself uh, as well as my colleague, Lena Zhu, um, who was also an important contributor to this work. Um, but we'd also be open to discussing any other, to uh, any other subjects in this topic as well. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Neal. I'll now turn it over to Mr. Park to provide an overview of the appraisal subcommittee's work. Thank you, Alicia. Good, after, good afternoon, Acting Director Wigio and other panelists. I appreciate the opportunity to address the important topic of home appraisal bias. This slide represents the appraisal regulatory system, which is truly unique. There is no other regulatory scheme like it in the United States. I provided a read ahead to give you more detailed background than I have time to share today. But since some of you might not be familiar with the appraisal regulatory system, and it's a key factor in addressing today's topic, I'll take just a couple of minutes to provide a high level overview of the key players and how it works. The regulatory system for appraisers and appraisals consists of three main components, the states, the private sector, and the federal government. The states, like most occupational licensing systems, carry out the administration of the credentialing process, including disciplining appraisers who failed to meet federal or state requirements. The appraisal foundation, the most unique aspect of this system has two independent congressionally authorized boards, the Appraisal Standards Board, or ASB, and the Appraiser Qualifications Board, or AQB. These two boards set the uniform appraisal standards, commonly referred to as USPAP, and the minimum qualification criteria required to obtain and maintain an appraiser credential. In other words, how much education and experience are needed as well as the examination requirement requirements. States are allowed to exceed the ASB and AQB requirements, but, are, but not have lesser requirements. The ASC is the federal government component. The ASC's role is to provide support 
and oversight for the states and the appraisal foundation. We enforce ASB, AQB, and other federal requirements through a state compliance review process, and we monitor and review the practices, procedures, activities, and organizational structure of the foundation. We also maintain the national registries of appraisers and appraisal management companies, and we support the states and the appraisal foundation by making federal grant funds available to both. Next slide, please. The ASC has seven member agencies on its board. The three banking agencies, along with NCUA, HUD, CFPB, and FHFA. The ASC is currently chaired by Tim Segerson with NCUA. The ASC is affiliated with the FFIEC, but is an independent executive branch federal government agency. Now, moving on to the topic at hand. Next slide, please. The ASC and ASC staff are very concerned about the reports of alleged racial bias in appraisals and the lack of diversity in the profession. A fundamental philosophy found in USPAP is public trust in appraisers and their work product. Recent allegations of racial bias by appraisers and the lack of diversity have clearly eroded that public trust, particularly among minority borrowers. Public trust in appraisers among this very important segment of society must be regained. To that end, the ASC is working on several initiatives to better understand the reasons for the lack of diversity in the industry and potential issues with appraisal practices. These initiatives include a comprehensive and independent review of USPAP and the real property appraiser qualification criteria. The goal of the review is to identify any practices, policies, and procedures in USPAP and the AQB criteria that encourage or systematize bias. The standards and qualifications should consistently support and promote fairness, equity, objectivity, and diversity in appraisals in the training and credentialing of appraisers. The ASC is also going to be hosting a series of roundtables on bias and discrimination in appraisals, and the first is scheduled to take place in September. The events will bring together individuals that are in and around the appraisal profession to inform and inspire constructive dialogue, bringing into focus qualifications, standards, processes, and practices currently in use and explore potential adjustments and alternative approaches that might produce more equitable outcomes in appraisals. This work is clearly needed. According to the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics, appraisers and assessors, which are grouped together in their uh, stats, are 96.5% white and 70% men. This places appraisers and assessors dead last out of several hundred occupations in terms of diversity. As executive director of the ASC, an appraiser myself, and simply as a human being, I find these allegations and revelations about the appraisal industry to be deeply disturbing, and I am committed to working with the ASC and ASC members and other stakeholders to find solutions. Last slide, please. The appraisal profession is also challenged by an overall lack of new entrants, not just minorities and women. Over the past 10 to 12 years, there, have been, there has been a 20 to 25% decline in the number of appraisers on the national registry. So not only is the profession faced with a lack of diversity, it is also faced with an aging population, declining numbers, and few new entrants, even as demand for appraisal services has been increasing. One possible reason for the lack of new entrants and the lack of diversity is the AQB's longstanding supervisor trainee model, which for the past 30 years has been the only way to obtain the necessary experience to become a licensed or certified appraiser. It is an apprenticeship model that has led to many appraisers being trained by family and close acquaintances, which has likely contributed to the lack of diversity. This is just one of the problems with this requirement. The AQB has been working uh, on an alternative for several years, but is yet to fulfill that uh, objective. To better understand these issues, the ASC is undertaking a comprehensive census and survey of stakeholders in the real property appraisal profession. 
including appraisers, appraisal management companies, lenders, state regulators, fair housing and lending authorities, and civil rights advocates. The goal of this project is to produce statistically valid data that depicts accurate and current demographics of the real property appraisal profession. It will also provide a trend analysis that will allow the ASC to understand short, medium, and long-term trends and needs in the profession. We are going into this census and survey project with a sense of humility. There is a lot we don't know about the extent of the DE&I challenges faced by the appraiser profession and the root causes for it. The census and survey project represents a serious effort by the ASC to get to the bottom of this issue and to strategically invest resources to produce a scientifically based measurement of where we are and how we got here. I also welcome the recently announced White House Task Force led by HUD Secretary Fudge that will be looking at these issues and hopefully proposing solutions. In addition, HR 2553, which passed out of the House Financial Services Committee, would establish an interagency task force facilitated by the ASC to analyze federal collateral underwriting standards and guidance, and for, the, for other purposes, such as providing grants and scholarships to historically black colleges and universities to increase diversity among appraisers. In conclusion, while I understand that the focus is on appraisers and the appraisal process, and deservedly so, in order to fix this problem as quickly and effectively as possible, it will require a holistic study of the entire mortgage lending and underwriting process. Appraisers are subject to many federal and state statutes, rules, and guidelines. <clears throat> These two must be scrutinized to understand their contributions to bias and discrimination in the appraisal and overall mortgage lending process. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Park. Mr. Neal and Mr. Park, many thanks to you both for your presentations, which will greatly inform our discussion this afternoon. The first conversation we'll turn to is our federal agency panel that the acting director will help facilitate. So I'll turn it over to the acting director. Great, thanks again, Alicia, and thanks to our presenters for those presentations. Uh, so, the way we'll proceed here will be short remarks from each participant on the federal agency panel, and then we will engage in a discussion that will precede the, uh, the civil rights roundtable. So first up uh, is Todd Harper, the chair of the National Credit Union Administration. Todd was nominated to the NCUA board in 2019 and sworn in as a member of the board that same year, and President Biden designated him as the NCUA's 12th chairman on January 20th, 2021. As NCUA board chair, Mr. Harper serves as a voting member of the Financial Stability Oversight Council, uh, and he is also the current chair of the Federal Financial Institutions Examinations Council, uh, as well as sitting on the Financial and Banking Information Inter Infrastructure Committee, uh, as well as the board of directors for NeighborWorks America. Uh, prior to joining the NCUA board, Mr. Harper served as the director of the agency's Office of Public and Congressional Affairs uh, and as a chief policy advisor to former chairman Debbie Matz and Rick Metzger. Uh, he is the first member of the NCUA staff to become an NCUA board member and chairman, and uh, as I know from direct experience, has deep passion and experience with this issue. So without further ado, uh, Todd, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Damon. Thank you to you and to everyone at the CFPB for organizing today's proceedings. The issue of appraisal bias is really an important one for us to explore. In my public speeches, I often note that there are three ways in which to close the wealth gap. The first is to open and to fund an IRA. Another is to start a small business. And the third is to purchase and own a home. We know, however, that purchasing a home is often out of reach for far too many people of color. And one way to close that gap is to look at the issue of appraisal bias. More than a decade ago in the Dodd-Frank Act, Congress enacted reforms aimed at addressing problems in the appraisal industry. And many organizations on our panel of consumer and civil rights advocates today supported those reforms. Among other things, Congress strengthened the powers of the FFIEC's appraisal subcommittee, which, uh, as Jim noted, supervises state regulatory programs. Those reforms also aimed to address appraisal independence, and appraisal inflation. 
Today, we continue to see stress in the appraisal system, including bias based on race. I have read multiple news accounts, and Dave, the one that you highlighted earlier certainly uh, makes that point uh, at home. I'm deeply concerned about this problem. Existing statutes like the Fair Housing Act, the Equal Credit Opportunity Act, and Title XI of the Financial Institutions Reform, Recovery, and Enforcement Act all aim to address this problem, but we need to use these laws to regulate, adopt rules, supervise, and enforce against appraisal bias. One issue that I'm hoping that federal regulators can finally complete work on is the long overdue quality control standards for automated valuation models or AVMs, which we heard about earlier today. I say long overdue because I began working on these issues uh, in the year 2001 um, and have uh, been following this issue. And 11 years is too long to wait for us to adopt these standards. In the Dodd-Frank Act, Congress required um, a, a, a quality control standard for AVMs that were to be developed by several regulators, including the NCUA, the CFPB, and the OCC. Um, and we are working to develop joint rules on this. In finalizing the rule, we ought to look at applying fair lending laws when evaluating the algorithms contained in the models used to determine automated values. I had a professor a long time ago who taught me garbage in, garbage out. And it's so important to make sure that there's good quality information getting in that isn't getting changed in some way so that good quality information can come out of the process. You know, another worthy idea that we should dust off is the issue of appraisal portability, uh, which was another set of provisions in the Dodd-Frank Act. Currently, the lender who underwrites the loan owns the appraisal even though it's usually the consumer who pays for that appraisal. If the consumer wants to go to a different lender, they need to get a new appraisal and incur that cost. Giving the consumers the ability to pay once for an appraisal and to shop around for a better mortgage rate and price is another way to combat loan discrimination. In closing, I look forward to hearing more about the ideas presented today, especially on the next panel. We should take these suggestions, examine them closely, and then act on the best of them. Great, thank you very much, Todd, and excited to hear more of your thoughts uh, in the subsequent panel. Uh, the next panelist I'd like to introduce uh, is Michael Sue of the, uh, the Acting Comptroller of the Currency from the OCC. Uh, Mike became Acting Comptroller of the Currency on May 10th, 2021, uh, upon his designation as first Deputy Comptroller by the Secretary of Treasury, Janet Yellen. Prior to joining the OCC, Acting Comptroller Sue served as an Associate Director in the Division of Supervision and Regulation at the Federal Reserve Board of Governors. In that role, he chaired the Large Institution Supervision Coordinating Committee and Operating Committee, which has responsibility for supervising the global system systemically important banking companies operating in the United States. Acting Comptroller Sue also co-chaired the Federal Reserve's Systemic Risk Integration Forum, served as a member of the Basel Committee Risk and Vulnerabilities Group, and co-sponsored FORA, promoting interagency coordination with foreign and domestic financial regulatory agencies. Uh, with that, by way of introduction, uh, the floor is yours, Mike. Thanks, Dave. Good afternoon. I want to thank uh, Acting Director Regio for hosting this event and inviting me to participate. Events like these take a tremendous amount of energy by staff to pull them off, so I commend everyone involved for putting on such a terrific program on a very important topic. We are here at an opportune time in history where the energy to tear down barriers to fair and equal participation in our economy may finally exceed the resistance protecting the status quo. We are seeing regulators, industry, and stakeholders work together to root out structural obstacles that have resulted in a legacy of unfairness and inequality. As Todd mentioned, sustained access to affordable housing has long been one of the most important foundations of a more just economy. Real estate appraisals play an important role in the home buying process. Biased appraisals can keep a family from getting approved for a loan or raise the price of a loan. It can trap undervalued neighborhoods by depressing property taxes, resulting in lower income to support education and infrastructure. Biased appraisals mean good loans to creditworthy customers go unmade. That's not just bad business. It locks people in unfairly, creating even more distance between the haves and the have-nots. As journalists, academics, and advocates have pointed out, discrimination and bias 
and appraisals contribute to inequality uh, in housing values and adversely affect a critical source of wealth accumulation for minority families. The impact is large and cannot be ignored. Studies have found that homes in black neighborhoods are valued at roughly half the price of homes in neighborhoods with few or no black residents. That difference has led to a $156 billion cumulative loss in value nationwide for majority black neighborhoods, according to a study by the Brookings Institution. While appraisers and the appraisal process are not often seen as part of the banking system, there are clear intersections. Banking regulations require appraisals on certain transactions, and banks rely on third-party appraisals in their underwriting and overall risk management practices. Regulators, including the OCC, expect banks to ensure their vendors treat customers fairly and do not discriminate. We are seeing banks held accountable for discrimination in appraisals they use. Holding banks is accountable, but is necessary, uh, but not sufficient to solve the problem of bias in appraisals. The solution requires a collective effort by all the stakeholders participating in watching this event today. I applaud the civil rights leaders and others participating for holding us accountable on this issue and engaging in solutions-oriented discussions that can make appraisals fairer in the future while also meeting the, need, the underwriting needs of the $11 trillion in mortgage loans in our country. I look forward to this discussion and to working with my colleagues and stakeholders on this important opportunity. Thanks. Thank you, Mike. Uh, and our final panelist is Elena McCargo, Senior Advisor to the Secretary at the Department of Housing and Urban Development. Elena recently joined the Biden administration as Senior Advisor for High Net Housing Finance to Secretary of HUD, Marsha Fudge. She was previously Vice President for the Housing Finance Policy Center at the Urban Institute, where she led development of research programming and strategy with a focus on reducing racial homeownership gaps, removing barriers to homeownership, and building wealth equity. She also previously held leadership roles with J.P. Morgan Chase, CoreLogic, Fannie Mae, and the U.S. Treasury Department. Uh, Elena, the floor is yours. Good afternoon, and thank you for hosting this really timely event. I'd like to say on behalf of Secretary Fudge and the Department of Housing and Urban Development, um, a, a big thanks to CFPB uh, and you, Acting Director uh, Lito, for uh, convening today's, um, today's event, really important and, and, and really the right time. Uh, HUD and our Office of Fair Housing and Equal Opportunity has received uh, a growing number of reports of appraisal bias and discrimination. All the panelists so far have, have really talked about how this has been uh, impacting each of our agencies and, and, the, and the work that we do uh, in different ways. Um, th these, uh, these reports have um, included information about uh, undervaluation of properties, uh, but it also really uh, at the heart of this creates inequities when it comes to wealth building through home ownership that we really want to get to the bottom of. Uh, in fact, our Office of Fair Housing uh, and Equal Opportunity reports cases of appraisal related discrimination have increased 10 times in volume since 2019. Uh, these issues span not only the valuation outcomes that are disparate for people of color, but also involve specific appraiser practices and methods, automated valuation approaches, uh, lending requirements, and the diversity um, of the appraisal industry itself and the employment practices and requirements. So the appraisal industry, um, as, as uh, I think someone else previously noted, um, is skewed over 85% white uh, with less than 2% of appraisers identifying as black. Um, these issues do present themselves and I think this is a real um, opportunity to, to take a look at the practices, the, the industry itself uh, and, um, and methods and really um, try to attack this head on. During his speech at the commemoration of the 100th anniversary of the Tulsa massacre, which was just two weeks ago, President Biden charged Secretary Fudge with leading an interagency effort to address inequity in home appraisals. This work ties directly to the president's orders to HUD to address and enforce the Fair Housing Act and to every agency to address the growing equity issues and systemic barriers that continue to hinder progress for people of color in this country. Our department has reached out to the CFPB and other federal agencies, uh, independent agencies as well, to start and develop what we're calling the Task Force on Property Appraisal and Valuation Equity. Participants will include financial regulators, federal housing agencies, and other indep independent agencies that have equities in this area. The task force will assess the extent, causes, and effects of property misvaluation and recommend actions to address this issue. 
We will engage with stakeholders uh, who have uh, many relevant perspectives or information on this, including uh, the civil rights community, fair housing organizations, state and local officials, uh, and industry participants. So as we mark June as Homeownership Month, we look forward to working with the CFPB and other partners on this critically important issue as part of the Biden-Harris administration's broader efforts to bridge the racial wealth and homeownership gaps that persist. So really look forward to the conversation today and thank you for including us uh, in this roundtable. Absolutely, thank you so much, Elena. Uh, and just to note for participants, I'm also going to invite Jim Park from the appraisal subcommittee of the FFIC back uh, to join the panel, although I will not invite him to give his remarks over again. Uh, so uh, why don't we start up top? You know, obviously the, the media has written a significant amount about the racial wealth divides that we see kind of in broad strokes, but certainly focused in on this specific topic. And, and really, you know, a substantial portion of that seems like it can be tied to the valuation of people's homes, you know, as I think we well know. And, and through that reporting, it's been a recognized practice that I think in particular the African-American community, black community, have often had to redo their homes in order to affect an equitable valuation. Uh, I personally find this deeply troubling, but would love to hear from the panel. Maybe, maybe I'll direct it to Elena first, and I know, Todd, you probably have thoughts on this as well, and we can kind of go from there. So I, I appreciate you starting there. I think that we have seen, and I mean, we've all seen the news stories that you're referring to. It seems like there is one at least a week that's highlighted of a family that has had to um, to, you know, to, to overcome uh, this particular type of situation. I, I just, I would just say that I think we all are um, acutely aware of the, um, you know, disparities in the real estate uh, market that have persisted for, for, um, for some time. And we know that that has led to uh, what we, what is sort of a home, you know, a wealth and homeownership gap that persists today. Uh, and and you know and, and a number of practices need to be reviewed. This is one aspect of um, of what is a broader systemic issue. And so I do think that um, having many different perspectives, not only from these intergovernmental groups that are going to be um, talking about this issue, but really from those participants, uh, real estate professionals, lenders, and others that are major parts of the system working together. Um, you know, I think there are going to be many opportunities to really try to come up with a set of recommendations uh, that can address some of the disparities and things that we are seeing head on. Uh, and so I'm, I'm, again, just we are grateful to the president for, um, for, for establishing this task force, really starting this conversation um, in earnest. And I think it's not only federal, but also local civil rights and other um, groups and industry participants together are, are going to be able to really solve and address what is at the heart of, of that um, of that particular issue. So we're really looking forward to that. You know, absolutely. Thank, thank you for that, Elena. And, and Todd, how, how is this, how, how are you seeing this from the NCUA and, and also maybe from your unique role as chair of the FFIC? Yeah, no, um, you know, first of all, uh, Elena hits it straight on the head when she talks about the fact that this is one aspect of a much broader issue overall. Um, and, and I also say this, it's not a new issue necessarily. Um, I can think back about 16, 17 years ago in the Poconos. Um, we had a large number of people who were moving out of the New York area and into the exurbs, um, and they were getting trapped by faulty appraisals on the upside, uh, such as that they were buying a home for $250,000 that was only worth for maybe $120,000, uh, and they were unable to, to finance that. From the NCUA's perspective, I think I'll start here. First and foremost, credit unions and the credit union mission is built on a philosophy of meeting the credit and um, savings needs of their members, including those of modest means. And so if you look at the heart of the credit union system, it's important to remind people that, that includes helping people of color. And we need to help people of color access and build wealth um, uh, in order to overcome the systemic racism that we have seen over time. From the FFIC's perspective, Dave, I think that one issue that we can use this moment in time to do is to look at matters of economic equity and justice. Uh, in all honesty, it's not been something that 
the appraisals um, that the FFIAC has focused on traditionally, although we have shined a light on the appraisal subcommittee to work over the last decade to improve how the appraisal subcommittee performs. But clearly, as Jim pointed out in his presentation, there are some real problems here. And, and, and one of those key issues is we need to be looking at how do we get new people into this profession? We also need to be looking uh, across the agencies and using the, NC, uh, the FFIAC seat for being a, a, a catalyst for bringing people together to collaborate and converse in order to create change. We need to be looking um, at the issue of the appraisal valuation models uh, and, and applying pressure in order to move ahead on that. So those are a couple of things on my mind. Yeah, thank you for that. And uh, want to make sure that there is space for for Mike or Jim, if you'd like to weigh in on that question. Otherwise, I can move to the next. Well, Great. Yeah, go from, ahead. From uh, uh, from my perspective, the the idea that that uh, black homeowners and borrowers uh, feel that they must de black or whitewash their their homes prior to an appraiser coming in. It's, it's frankly heartbreaking, and the stories that that appear to support that these tactics actually work are um, at a minimum frustrating and actually infuriating. At the heart of the appraisal process uh, is objectivity and independence. The the owner of a home, the owner of any property, the borrower should have absolutely nothing to do with. Uh, the appraiser's opinion of value. And I just want to urge anyone who feels that there are a, that an appraiser has taken race, gender, sexual orientation into consideration in the appraisal of their home or any property that they're involved with, uh, they should turn that appraiser into the state appraiser regulatory um, program. Every state and territory in the United States has a state regulatory uh, uh, appraisal program, and there they can deal with those complaints, and they should because if appraisers are doing that, they're violating use PAP, and they should be disciplined. Jim, can I just interrupt you for a quick second here because I think it's important to note that one of the things that you all oversee is the appraisal hotline because it's hard for consumers to necessarily know. So they, if you don't know who the right person is to call, you can help them, can't you? Yes, uh, the appraisal hotline is for the purpose of referring users of the hotline to the appropriate authority. We don't have any enforcement authority or anything like that in this regard, but the purpose of the hotline is to refer um, users to the appropriate authority who can. And we're in the process of looking at the hotline uh, to see if there are ways that we can augment it uh, to address this issue as well. It, it's needed. Yeah, and Mike, go right ahead. I just want to echo something that uh, Alana and Todd said earlier. This is not a new problem. Like, this has been around for a really long time. I think what is new, I think two things are new. First, there's more awareness around this because some of these stories are coming out, and that's good. But I think, really, there's a greater awareness now. This is connected to home ownership, which is connected to the wealth gap. And I think that th th this connectivity is really it does a couple of things. Most importantly, it puts some urgency around the issue, which I think is really important. That's why events like this are so important. The other is we're all doing this together. That makes a huge difference because what it means is that it's not just one agency saying this. We're kind of doing this all together so that across the banking agencies, across uh, CF, the federal uh, financial agencies, speaking with one voice on this really, I think, gives an opportunity to make some change. And I know there's some opportunities there, some ideas. Uh, about how to really move the needle here. And I think that that's fantastic. Yeah, no, thank you for that. So hearing a couple of themes from that, you know, obviously, from my perspective, it's a, it's a really good case study in systemic discrimination, right? Because we, obviously, we've touched on the role that individuals are playing in this, uh, I think, on the side of the, the appraisal itself, a little bit of mention about resources available to individual consumers who are subject to discrimination, which frankly, can be very difficult to discern uh, from the side of the consumer, right? I, I think there's a lot of this that's happening behind the curtain. Uh, but also this kind of recognition that there are many layers to this and there is a need for a coordinated effort to attack it. So that, that might be a good segue to my next question that I'm, 
I'm curious specifically about you know, going up from the individual level. Let, let's talk a little bit about housing planning policies, state laws, kind of that next level of the framework that's contributing to this phenomenon and this pernicious problem that are ultimately impacting valuations uh, in minority communities, right? So both for individual homeowners, but obviously for the communities that they reside in. Maybe I'll uh, ask Elena again if you want to take that first and then maybe Jim next. Sorry, apologies, I apologies. <laughs> um, it always happens. Um, and um, can you um, can you just repeat for me? Because um, I had a moment of audio glitch. Sure, no, no, no problem at yeah. all. Just just looking to hear your thoughts about that kind of next level beyond the individual level when we're talking about housing planning policies, maybe state laws that are contributing to this overall problem that's ultimately impacting the valuations in these minority communities. Sure. So, uh, you know, so I do think uh, it goes back to the thought, uh, you know, real estate is local. Uh, and so a lot of what we are, you know, seeing and a lot of the, the honestly, the interventions and the outcomes that I think will be recommended are going to require uh, an incredible coordination and, and conversation with state and local uh, leaders because uh, the um, the industry is is very state uh, and and locally run uh, and and so I think um, I think there's a an, an you know this is one of those areas that really does require and I think as we're thinking as cities and states are doing planning around um, around you know housing activities affordable housing uh, and and the like that this this consideration for uh, for what's happening um, on the in the homeowner on the homeownership front. Uh, as well as the consideration of the the major racial homeownership gaps that persist in a lot of communities uh, has a lot to do with this. And I mean, you could uh, there's a lot of data, and I'll, I'll leave it to the researchers uh, that share. I mean, but that they could share with us just as you look at community by community, uh, the disparities you see along sort of where people live along income lines, and then where and house prices and. Um, and the like, and, and where we see valuations coming out, and how how real estate markets work. So I think that there's a lot. Uh, it's a, it's a tremendously um, important point to focus on the state and local levers here, because uh, whether it's how appraisers are certified through their boards locally, what the requirements are for apprenticeships, you know, how diverse you can really get your you know the industry to be to really meet the needs of the communities that you're in, all of that's really locally driven and it's gonna be really important um, to stay very connected and, and, and have that be part of the conversation that the, um, that the federal agencies are gonna be having over the next six months or so. Fantastic, thanks. And, and Jim, how about it? How are you seeing uh, housing planning policies and state laws intersecting with this phenomenon in the work of the appraisal subcommittee? As I mentioned, um, the Appraisal Foundation has the authority to set uniform standards and minimum qualifications for appraisers, but the states also have the authority to exceed those requirements, and and some do. Um, that that creates um, a real patchwork quilt of requirements around the country, which can make it even more difficult for consumers, appraisers, lenders, and so forth to. Uh, uh, to make sure that uh, everybody is treating is being treated fairly and, and equitably, um, there's uh, we could see. Uh, I think it'd be a good idea if we saw more diversity on state appraisal boards. Uh, there's only one one state that I'm aware of, Alabama, that requires uh, minority uh, participation on on their board. Um, I think that we could. This kind of gets outside of the question a little bit. But um, I think that there could be other things done in terms of, of how appraisals are completed. Right now, uh, appraisals and historically appraisal, appraisals result in the appraisal process results in a one, one point value. And that's actually not how the market works. The market is uh, reflective, reflects a, a range of values. If appraisers were able to uh, provide a range of values that I think would also help um, in terms of the lend lending process. And then I think uh, 
providing more data. Data and information is power. And the GSEs and other secondary market participants have now amassed a huge amount of data that uh, if more of it was made available to appraisers and more of it was made available to consumers, that would uh, act as a check and balance, if you will, so that appraisers and consumers both had a lot more information available to them so that it would be more difficult to uh, allow uh, intentional or unintentional bias to creep into uh, uh, their opinions of value. Absolutely, thank you for that. And uh, just quickly, Mike or Todd, I don't know if you have something you'd like to add on housing planning policy or state law. Okay, good to know. Um, so wh why don't we move then to uh, what I think is a, a little bit of a selfish question, although you know my staff may live to regret it, but obviously I think that there is a, there's a working hypothesis here that we all have a role to play and that each of our agencies is well situated to tackle certain things. And so I, I'm curious to hear from the panel, you know, what do you think the Bureau ought to be doing uh, here to be doing our part well, you know, where our authorities are well situated or our capabilities? Uh, and that could include what kinds of tools do you think we should develop? You know, as I'm sure you're aware, we uh, built the housing portal for the government and uh, do have some ability to do things in a, a more contemporary technology way. Um, but uh, if, if you had a wish list of us, now's your chance to, to get it out there in the public record. Uh, and whoever would like to start. I'll, I'll just take a quick stab. Um, and, and it's really, the, the Bureau's done a tremendous job. This is a really important consumer facing issue um, that I, you know, what, what I think someone else mentioned on the panel just a little bit earlier, um, awareness has gone a long way. It's why we've seen such a, an increase, I think, in cases in our fair housing um, complaints um, over the last couple of years. It's just simply awareness uh, of this issue. And I do think that there are probably a set of tools and resources that um, the CFPB uh, could amass through various agencies on different perspectives of what, what you're seeing or when you might be seeing appraisal bias because people um, are still learning what that even is and what it might look like or what forms it might take. Um, so I, I, I do think that that's um, an opportunity and you guys have done a really great job of um, putting those kinds of resources together on your um, on your website. And I think that that's an opportunity um, for, for a future resource that would be uh, that would be really helpful and just point people in the direction of where to file complaints and what kinds of things may constitute um, you know violations uh, of, of different kinds. Um, the other thing I would I, I would just mention is um, the um, I, I think the the tools uh, that and the data and sort of uh, again the collection of research there has been for years a lot of work done on this topic and I think um, as we work together I, I just feel like there's an opportunity to really pull together kind of the really key stats and information. Uh, and also potentially data collection that agencies could be doing that would better inform uh, the issue as well, because there are data gaps and constraints. Um, and someone mentioned that the GSEs have done a, a ton of work to really um, pull together um, data, but how do we start to make that more visible through, you know, tools um, and resources like, um, you know, I just hummed that comes to mind and other things that, that um, that are collected uh, uh, data sources that would really be helpful in understanding this, these valuation issues um, through a data lens. So that's another place where I think the CFPB could be really helpful. Okay, yeah. thoughts. Please. Sorry. Sorry, I didn't want to talk over anyone. Um, but AVMs are really, uh, automated valuation models, are really playing a huge role in the appraisal market now. Um, the GSEs use them for waivers, um, just very broad use now. But um, they're really not a panacea because there's so much of them are based on historic data. And, uh, you know, there's, there's a lot of unresolved issues with them. And I think the CFPB could really help address that by um, promoting some research on them. Um, one aspect of research would be how to determine if an AVM is producing a biased result. There, maybe there can be some built-in checking for every um, appraisal that's done by an AVM. There can be a, you know, a score that analyzes whether there's any risk that the um, that the data has been skewed. Also, there needs to be a certification process, some kind of test that all new AVM products need to pass. 
And um, there's lots of different metrics out there, different ways of doing things, but I don't think anyone's really done um, research on the best way to do that. Uh, you know, ideally, I mean, we no one needs to create a new government agency, but ideally maybe there could be some, you know, publicly available algorithm that everyone agrees on. And so uh, software designers could say, we've passed the, you know, CFPB certified test for, for anti-discrimination, something like that. And I think that would be a really useful tool for the, the Bureau to work on. You leverage your research capacity, really great, um, some really great thinkers there, and, and that would move, help move the market a little. Thanks, Andrew. I, uh, a bit of a preview for the next panel, um, but I, I will say that obviously uh, algorithmic bias is very top of mind. I don't think we're going to have AVMs escape this conversation. Uh, so it is it is not lost on me. I, I appreciate that. I also have a strong bias towards the creation of new government agencies, but that's maybe just me. Uh, so I don't, Mike Todd, if you uh, have anything else you want to add on this? Yeah, no, I, I, first of all, completely agree that, you know, we need to finish work on ABMs and completely agree that you've got a great role to play in terms of consumer education um, on this issue and building out even more resources on your website. But a couple of further ideas come to mind. First of all, when it comes to federal uh, appraisal law and oversight, you know, there has to be a federal nexus. That is, is there deposit insurance or is there share insurance backed by the taxpayer on it? And that leaves, there are a whole bunch of transactions that occur that are private transactions uh, that don't have a federal nexus. So you might want to explore where is there opportunity there related to the private transactions, which we know at different points in time have made up a considerable amount of the mortgage lending market. Another issue um, that we should all look at is I know that when I was working uh, for Congressman Kinjorski, who wanted to write the initial appraisal independence standard at the federal level, we looked to the states to see what laws were out there and pulled together the best ideas out there um, on appraisal independence. I bet that there are probably some states that are working on appraisal bias right now and looking at what is out there, we can start to import into uh, federal standards and federal regulations. And then um, one last thing uh, comes to mind, and that is when we first started uh, and created the appraisal subcommittee uh, back in 1990, was it, I can't even remember what year it was right now, but the original threshold was about $10,000 for what would be a, threat, uh, a federally related transaction. And soon that became 25 and 40, and then it went to 250 and stayed at 250,000, it's now gone up to 400,000. I have to ask if that threshold is too high. Um, and I say that because in particular, we know that people of color have bought homes that are at a lower value than people who are white in this country. And don't they deserve protections that an appraiser provides? I mean, for me, the appraiser is the independent referee for the buyer, the seller, the lender, and the secondary market that, you know, this home, I've gone through it, we, that we've estimated some value. If you keep putting those thresholds too high, you're decreasing protections for a certain part of our marketplace. And I think that's something we need to look at. Thank you very much, Todd. Mike, uh, you want the last word? Yeah, so I'll just echo, just uh, kind of agree with every, things that everyone have said. I would echo something that Alana brought up on data. I think, I think there is um, some room there where, you know, I think some of the most compelling stories so far have been anecdotal, which is great. Backing that up with data really helps to focus resources because then we can, where is the problem? Where do we need to push? So that's one. So hugely supportive of that. Um, and the other is, you know, Dave, you and I, we've already started, and Todd, we've already started kind of uh, a lot of the interagency dialogue. I think that helps. I think cascading that down to the staff level. I think the examiners want to do the right thing. And I think it really helps to connect them so that you know, we're all kind of speaking from the same page. And I think that's very forceful because the industry, uh, they, they don't necessarily differentiate between all these bodies, but they're hearing the same thing from different, that makes it a much more powerful and effective message, uh, which I think is really important here. Fantastic. Well, look, thanks to, again, to all our federal agency partners for this robust discussion, particularly appreciative for those of you who I have now made late for your two o'clock meetings. Uh, and thank you for providing your perspectives and background on this issue and setting the stage for this next roundtable discussion. Uh, so at this point, I'm looking forward to moderating a robust policy discussion on addressing abrasal bias with my co-moderator, CFPB's Assistant Director for Lending and Equal Opportunity, Patrice Ficklin.
Great, thank you so much, Acting Director, and thanks to all of the federal agency partners and panelists. As the Acting Director mentioned, we will now transition to our roundtable discussion with advocates, civil rights leaders, and other experts. In the interest of time, I will briefly introduce our roundtable participants. So I'll start with Nikitra Bailey, an Executive Vice President at the Center for Responsible Lending, the policy affiliate of Self-Help, the nation's largest community development lender. Ms. Bailey plays an integral role in developing and driving the strategic direction of the organization's consumer protection and fair lending agenda. I'll also just note that she is a current member of the Bureau's Consumer Advisory Board. So thank you, Nikitra. Next, I'll introduce Megan Haverly. She's the Senior Policy Counsel at the NAACP Legal Defense Fund. Through litigation, advocacy, and public education, LDF seeks structural changes to expand democracy, eliminate disparities, and achieve racial justice. Next, we have Lot Diaz. He's the Vice President of Housing and Community Development at Unidos US, where he oversees the development and implementation of their community development programs and provides technical assistance coordination to Unidos US affiliates in developing and financing real estate projects home ownership programs, single family real estate development, and alternative financial services programs. Next, we have Will Jordan, Executive Director of the Metropolitan St. Louis Equal Housing and Opportunity Council, which works to ensure equal access to housing for all people through education, counseling, investigation, and enforcement. Next, we have Amy Nelson, Executive Director of the Fair Housing Center for Central Indiana, whose mission is to ensure equal housing opportunities by eliminating housing discrimination through advocacy, enforcement, education, and outreach. I'll move to Caroline Petey, uh, Executive Director of Fair Housing Advocates of Northern California, which has been dedicated to equal housing opportunities since 1984. Um, we have joining us as well as Andrew Pizer, staff attorney at the National Consumer Law Center um, here in the Washington, D.C. office, where he works on issues related to mortgage financing and defending homeowners from foreclosure. We're also joined by Lisa Rice, president and CEO of the National Fair Housing Alliance, where she leads efforts to advance fair housing principles and to preserve and broaden fair housing protections expanding equal housing opportunities for millions of Americans. And last but not least, we have Cy Richardson, a senior vice president at the National Urban League, which is a nonpartisan historic civil rights organization based in New York City that advocates on behalf of economic and social justice for African Americans and against racial discrimination in the United States. So I'll now turn the conversation over to the acting director and the Fair Lending and Equal Opportunity Assistant Director, Patrice Ficklin, excuse me. Great, thanks again, Alicia. And uh, Patrice, would you like to tee up the first question for our panel? Oh, I'd be happy to, Acting Director Hui Jo. And thanks so much, Ms. Hampshire, or um, Alicia, as I normally refer to you, for the gracious introduction as well. Um, I think we want to start off by talking a little bit about and hearing from you all around the potential drivers of racial disparities in home valuations. And when I say racial disparities, I'm also thinking about ethnicity because I do wanna make sure um, that we, we pull in and include the experiences of Latinx and Hispanic consumers um, in this space as well. And also just the role that research might play in terms of um, identifying promising solutions to help address the racial appraisal disparities that we've talked about earlier. And I, I guess um, as we think about these questions of both the potential drivers and the role of research, I also just want to take a moment to note something that is just so gratifying, one of the many gratifying aspects of our acting director's priority um, with regard to racial and economic equity, which is that he's really emphasized the importance of us hearing from people who are on the ground dealing with these issues day to day and not just those of us who are in Washington focusing on policy um, and doing a very good job of that, um, not to distract from that. Um, but in that spirit, I'd like to first ask um, the Fair Housing Center of Central Indiana, um, so Amy Nelson, I'd like to actually start with Amy because I know that the Fair Housing Center of Central Indiana is uh, focusing on these issues on the ground. So I'd like to start with Amy 
and then um, have Amy uh, be followed by Lot Diaz, and then uh, we'll offer other panelists an opportunity to chime in as well. Um, so Amy, if you would take it away. Thank you so much, and thanks for the opportunity to be here today. So uh, we recently filed some HUD complaints with a, a, an African-American client who ended up whitewashing her home, had received two low appraisals, and then and the third appraisal whitewashed her home, and the price went up uh, dramatically. She lives in a historically black neighborhood, uh, a black neighborhood who uh, was redlined, and redlined, uh, redlining policies and the appraisal industry's role in sanctioning and pushing those redlining policies definitely plays into the disparities that we still have today. Her black neighborhood, which has remained historically black, while the neighborhoods around it have gentrified, has hung on to those by, by having, uh, by having uh, groups, neighborhood meetings to talk about estate planning so that these homes can stay in these neighborhoods. And it was a neighborhood that was one of the first in the country that did sweat equity programs for African-Americans who were completely shut out of the government-backed mortgages. So when we talk about how we got here, redlining, racial covenants, the appraisals industry's role in all of that, the lack of diversity that we've already been talking about here today within the appraisal um, industry itself, the, uh, the, the lack of understanding and knowledge that surprises me so much that people do not understand how these policies are still playing a role in these neighborhoods. We've been working on the ground. Not only have we been helping, uh, helping housing consumers who feel that they may have been discriminated against in the appraisal process, but we've also been doing an education campaign to just share with the public how we got here. Why do we have such a staggering home ownership gap based upon race and ethnicity by talking about the history of redlining, the history of sales-based discrimination. And we need more um, education type programs because so many people are unfamiliar with these policies that are still impacting our neighborhoods. Yes. Thank you so much, Amy. Um, Lot, did you have anything you wanted to offer with regard to the uh, information about the potential drivers and also the role that research might play in terms of identifying some solutions. Yeah, uh, on the driver's side, it's really important to remember appraisal is a commercial enterprise and uh, is engaged in buying and selling of a service to, from very, for, uh, vested parties. And like any vested service, there is going to be bias introduced by the priorities of those either purchasing or on the other side of the service. So, uh, and appraisal particularly, the, the ones uh, that are done by individuals, um, the perce there's perceptions that are involved in this. So there's lots of room uh, for errors. So, uh, you know, the comps is usually where you find this in, in the residential space, comparable for a particular house and what you're going to value at, value it at is a really critical element. And there's discretion there. They can give you an example. We have a neighborhood where one side, there was a relatively new development. The other side, which we bought like five or six house, homes through a sister agency, it was, you know, they, it needed the rehab. And when you started doing the valuation, they didn't point to the good side. They pointed to other bad houses around the neighborhood, right? Now, is that wrong or is that right? I don't know, but it's definitely discretion. I mean, you could say the land value uh, in the, the that uh, that is undoubtedly appreciated on the develop on the recently renovated side had some impact, right, uh, across the street. And uh, but those are all discretionary um, uh, discretionary decisions appraisers have. So the dialogue earlier about you know you know uh, diversifying the industry, um, you know. Uh, having better standards, more clarity on how to evaluate training on how to evaluate a situation like what I just described. Um, all those things play into uh, the process that has can have significant impact um, on the communities that we target. And particularly now, which I know with the African American community and the Latino community and others, um, home ownership and 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 increasing that rate within our, our communities is going to be critical and do something like um, uh, like appraisals having uh, there's enough headwinds to begin with and um, 
to add that to the list is something that we should all be concerned about. Um, regarding the research, I, I think the question, I mean, really isolating, I know uh, Michael and his presentation started, I, where, what are those areas that we want to isolate around? And to me, particularly in areas where you have very uneven development, the question of how uh, the kind of the regional economic space is going to impact that and uh, how, like, for instance, if an agency is going to do uh, redevelop a block, you know, how is that particular effort going to impact the value of that house? That is, it's, there's a lot of variables that would uh, impact that and just trying to di kind of defer, you know, dissect those in a way that allows appraisers to kind of have other touch points in terms of evaluation, I think would be helpful. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that those are, those are some powerful suggestions. And I'll just note that, you know, as my entire life, I can remember um, whitewashing our home in order to get a higher price. That's just something that's just known, you know, something that, um, you know, in a sense we've grown, grown up with. Um, and also just wondering about the role of consumer choice in selecting comparables or at least suggesting them. Uh, but anyway, I'll throw that out just to tantalize. Is there anyone else on the panel who would like to respond to the first question about potential drivers um, and um, opportunities for research um, before we move on to the next question? Perhaps I can Thank jump you. in if that's okay. Um, like Amy uh, Nelson, we at, at Fair Housing Advocates of Northern California, uh, we have seen uh, appraisal discrimination cases that have come in and we're representing a couple of folks in administrative complaints and lawsuits. Um, and as people have been talking about, you know, bias and appraisals falls into two categories. There's the individual bias by appraisers and then there's the systemic bias that's been created by decades of discriminatory policies, racism, segregation, and disinvestment. Um, and of course the use of sales comp comparisons in neighborhoods carries a legacy of redlining into the present uh, that people have been talking about already and allows historically undervalued appraisals to influence current values. So uh, one of the things that, you know, of course, we've also been hearing about the fact that uh, appraisers uh, are not a diverse group of people, which um, James Park discussed earlier. So there's a greater likelihood of baked in biases. Uh, I, I actually recently spoke to uh, someone who's in the appraisal business who said that he's talked to a number of appraisers and that they seem either unaware that there's a problem around the issue of appraisal bias or doesn't take it, they don't take it seriously at all, uh, at all. And the feeling around historically undervalued homes in the neighborhoods of color as well, well, that's just the way it is and there's nothing that can be done about it. Um, rather than approaching it, uh, a, a, an appraisal from a very thoughtful and careful process and consideration of exactly where the comps are being pulled from and wh whether they're truly accurate. We're seeing more cases of appra uh, appraisal discrimination based on race where in the case where um, Black homeowners have their home staged as though a white family owns it to receive the higher appraisals. They may be uh, victims of conscious or unconscious bias on the part of the appraiser who's using uh, very subjective standards. And um, in fact, acting uh, director Vejo mentioned our case in Marin City in his opening remarks where there was a $500,000 difference in two appraisals. Um, there's a broader issue at stake, though, of course, related to the undervaluation of homes in neighborhoods of color. And we've seen recent cases where Black families are trying to sell their property, trying to realize the appreciation in their homes, what they've done to make them uh, appreciate prior to selling, and how the history of redlining continues as appraisers are using lower comps in the neighborhood. Um, and that, that's our present day redlining. So I just wanted to mention one of our cases where this is an issue, even though the client was trying to refi in order to try to, to, to retire. So there's a single black woman of, she was ready to retire. Um, she owns a home in a gentrifying neighborhood in Oakland. Um, the house has been passed down through generations. And when she tried to refinance um, last summer, uh, the appraiser undervalued her home by more than $400,000 compared to a second appraiser three months later. The first appraiser based his valuation largely on comparable sales in census tracts over two miles away with higher concentrations of black residents than her census tract. Mm -hmm. The appraiser stated that the neighborhoods in closer proximity to her home historically demand a higher value. And while that may be true, it's true only because of deliberately racist historical policies such as redlining. And in addition, there were other problems with the valuation. For example, the appraiser didn't count one of the bedrooms. And the second appraiser used a more diverse set of comps, which resulted in a higher appraisal. Um, her case is currently um, at HUD. 
but that just give, gave an example of like this, the, the second appraiser choosing all these different comps that were um, it's a more thoughtful process in my in my uh, in my view. I'll stop there because I know lots of other people have things to say. But I'll just interject for a moment, and then I'm going to turn it over to Ms. Bailey. I saw Nikita Bailey um, uh, wanting to jump in. Um, you know, just um, one observation, Ms. Uh, is it pronounced Petey or Petey? Petey. Petey. Ms. Petey is that what you described in terms of the deliberate choice to look to a, a historically black community reminds me of when I was placed in um, remedial level classes when I joined a new school with the other black children, despite my standardized test scores and the and the straight A's that I had, it just was reminded of this notion of, uh, you know, um, of, um, in a sense, as you say, redlining, right? And that was educational redlining in my, uh, from my perspective. Um, and I'm also struck by Ms. McCargo's point that these, these disparities appear to be increasing. And so I'm wondering if it's a combination of awareness, um, but also just incidents as well. So I don't know if you're going to cover that, um, Ms. Bailey, in your comments, but I'll turn it over to you now. Thank you, Ms. Ficklin. One of the points I wanted to focus in on was also overvaluation, because I, I heard a lot about undervaluation today. And the recent subprime lending crisis is an example of that overvaluation. And as you know, CRO's research predicted that we would lead into the situation of a great recession because we saw African Americans and Latinos consistently steered into dangerous and toxic mortgages where there was overvaluation of the properties. And as a result of that, our communities lost a trillion dollars of wealth. So we, we also have to factor in that very critical point that we're, we're not dealing with real opportunities of fairness in black and brown communities. And I also wanna just get to your, your, your point about choice. Black and brown people have never had a choice about where they live. And I think your example, your, your, your recent example about your educational upbringing is an example of that. We've, we've just not had the possibility of choice. And that's part of the ongoing challenge that we have and why our nation's fair lending laws are so important and need to be fully enforced and should be the first line of uh, review in these situations. Thank you, Ms. Bailey. Um, was there anyone else trying to jump in on this? Because I'm going to turn it back over to the acting director to ask the next question, um, if not. All right, turning it back one, over sorry. to Oh, go ahead. Yeah, I had one just brief thought because it's a little bit off topic, but it is related. Um, you know, there's been horrible discrimination historically in access to mortgage credit. And um, that's continuing to a degree when it comes to lower value or smaller size mortgages. Um, I think the Urban Institute found that mortgages under 70,000 um, lending institutions don't want to make those. But if you own a house that's low value for whatever reason, either discrimination or, or just legitimately lower value, you need those mortgages to be able to rehabilitate your house, to um, add upgrades. And without access to that credit, that prevents you from building wealth. And that's tied to the appraisal of the home if it's assumed to be too low value to get a mortgage, you're not going to be able to do anything about it. So that's another area that I think is driving this and needs to be looked at. Thank you, Mr. Paisel. Thank you. Um, back to the acting director. Sure. Thank you very much, Patrice. And uh, so this next question is, I admit, quite a quite a broad one and, and really am focused on key actions it's like a prioritization question for you all so I'm, I'm curious what are you seeing as you look across this problem space as really the key remedies or solutions or promising avenues of uh, in intervention that you see to address and eliminate obviously a appraisal bias and, and i'll caveat that because as though the question weren't large enough you, and, and feel free to frame your response either around in-person appraisals and or around AVMs, because I don't want to lose sight of what's happening in the AVM space. And, and maybe I'll ask Mr. Richardson if he'd like to lead us off first, uh, uh, and then maybe Ms. Rice, and then we can go from there. I appreciate that. Thank you, Acting Director. I was going to jump into the last question. Um, yeah, I don't like to answer a question with a question, but I was quite you know curious and then attentive to Michael Neal's presentation earlier the slide he had looking at the Atlanta market, something was happening around 2000, 2001. There's some noise in the machine there. 
which I think we would look to in terms of maybe public policy implications because there were some uh, dis disruptive activities um, that were um, illustrative on that slide. I don't know if he's still on with us, but I, I might follow up with him to see what was happening there and there might be something instructive moving forward. Um, I would add to your point, um, first of all, in this kind of post-George Floyd era um, of kind of black empowerment or, or, or economic empowerment and inclusion, I've got to be honest, I'm a little bit um, um, I'm bearish on our prospects here. And I've got to be honest, because it's looking like we're dealing with a false choice of between kind of the appraisal industry reflecting the market or setting the market. And I think there's a, a wide kind of opportunities for public policy interventions in between. And I think it's the second time in, in 10 days I've heard um, James Park speak. And again, I appreciate his his his, his, his genuine outrage that these activities are, are occurring, but I think he's hit the nail on the head in terms of where the action is. And it's in the state level at this point, it seems to me we need to be talking about DNI activities, democratizing, diversifying those kind of regulatory instruments that go into um, feeding the entire kind of data structure, the kind of rubric for, for entry from a workforce development standpoint in, into the profession. And I think kind of disrupting that process is job one. The Urban League, for example, is working with the Appraisal Institute and Fannie Mae to, to provide stipends and scholarships for emerging young, um, interested appraisers of color to break into the industry, setting up um, um, educational stipends, a buddy system for mentoring in a, in a kind of interracial way, not just dependent on the, the insularity of, of working with someone of color. I think we need to fully disrupt the industry. Um, and again, an industry that is existentially a crisis, that is pale, male, and stale, and, and not leave anything on the sideline. And I think that is the kind of place we're at now. But I've got to say, the tension and the irony is, at the point in time where we're trying to bring more people of color into the decision-making mechanisms of the industry, we're talking about moving into a fully full-on automated space, which removes that kind of um, um, uh, autonomy and authority um, from the system. And I think that is um, a pendulum swing too far as well. I think data is the key, but again, in the hands of whom? I think we need to be kind of diversifying, democratizing those who are building the algorithms, the engineers. And again, all those folks who are on these state level boards, you mentioned Alabama, I think we can be a bit more center right center left than that. Um, so let's see where we can have some state level activities that really, in a measurable way, uh, perhaps in a scorecard kind of way, um, and compare and contrast where the states are to democratizing this industry. Um, and hopefully that will lead to better outcomes, more equitable outcomes. Thank you very much, Mr. Richardson. A lot of thoughts there about the way in which to make this more reflective of the population, broadly democratization and diversification therein, but also this tension with the move to uh, automation, right, which can easily replicate uh, the same pernicious dynamic. Um, so, uh, very helpful. Uh, Ms. Ms. Rice, would you like to uh, uh, Sure. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I was muted. Okay. Um, yeah, David, thank you so much for the question. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a very uh, critical, important question. And I wanted to raise one point, um, David, that I think is important not to miss, especially when it comes to the Fair Housing Act. And that is what constitutes an appraisal under the Fair Housing Act is extremely broad. So for example, when someone wants to sell their home and is getting the real estate agent's opinion of the value of the property, well, that constitutes an appraisal uh, for purposes of the Fair Housing Act. So I just wanna remind us that um, while we may be talking about appraisals in the context of a lending transaction, it's much broader than that. And so we need to loop in those other real estate professionals as we talk about appraisal and evaluation bias issues. One of the things that I think um, is most critical uh, in terms of remedies and solutions is training. Uh, we have to train appraisers and real estate professionals about fair housing issues, uh, about anti-discrimination issues, and how some of the practices that they may be utilizing can lead to uh, biases in the outcome. But we also have to have, I think, better enforcement, um, David. Uh, you know, at, at the heart of this, I mean, we all have been talking about the fact that there is bias in the process. 
Uh, and so we have to make sure that we have adequate resources and provisions for investigating cases. We have to ensure that fair housing organizations, uh, federal agencies who are uh, uh, providing the oversight over this area are well resourced so that they can uh, tackle these issues. Um, I've conducted a number of appraisal bias investigations and invo been involved in litigating a number of cases, and I can tell you they take a tremendous amount of resources to investigate these cases. Uh, investigations are not inexpensive at all, so we have to make sure that those resources are there. Um, I think, David, we also need to educate consumers because most of the consumers that I have dealt with, they did not even know that they were being discriminated against. They didn't even recognize the uh, bias, and that is because you know, consumers are not professionals. They don't know how to analyze an appraisal report. And the other thing is that in most transactions, the consumers don't even get the appraisal report. And so we didn't even know the appraisal bias existed unless either there was a whistleblower or we uh, ordered the appraisal and then analyzed it at the fair housing centers. Um, David, um, you asked a question earlier about fair housing planning and how that all plays in this, like housing planning processes. And I didn't want to let that, uh, that, that question go without delving a little bit deeper into it and, and really uh, putting a pin uh, in the point that the affirmatively furthering fair housing mandate comes into play here, right? That as jurisdictions and states are undertaking the exercise of identifying fair housing barriers, impediments to fair housing in their jurisdictions, as they are uh, developing their analyses of impediments to fair housing or their assessments of fair housing, they have to be including this issue in that assessment and have to be uh, proposing strategies for overcoming uh, bias in the appraisal markets uh, in, in those plans. And those plans have to then be enfolded into other plans that the jurisdictions are undertaking. And then the last thing that, that I'll say um, is I think we really need to take more aggressive steps to removing subjectivity from the process. Uh, this is, I, I did one case, uh, uh, David, in which the judge said, uh, as she was holding the appraiser not liable for his actions of discrimination, that appraising is an art, not a science. And what I think we need to do is move the appraising and valuation process to becoming more of a science and less of a subjective art, if you will. Thank you very much for that, at least a lot of a lot of strong points there. Uh, other members of the panel, would you like to respond to this question? Sure, I would. I'd love to. Go ahead, Mr. Jordan, and okay. then maybe uh... quickly. Uh, I, re I I just uh, appreciate the remarks that uh, Lisa Rice just gave, and I agree with them 100%. Uh, in St. Louis, we also have a um, appraisal case with, that's pending with HUD right now, um, and um, one of the things I've talked with real estate agents who are very frustrated uh, because they are running into deals that are falling through because of the appraisal gap issue with houses that, in their opinion, of course, should meet, uh, um, uh, should be, are ready for sale. And uh, one of the things I, I noticed is that in the state of Missouri, which is the biggest linchpin for uh, regulating those appraisers, well, the state of Missouri is a very conservative state. And so there's no real incentive without federal fair housing protections, affirmatively further fair housing, these different mechanisms that are put in place uh, with uh, fair housing and equal opportunity at HUD, really kind of the uh, regulator, uh, along with uh, DOJ and, and to a lesser extent, uh, CFPB, to make certain that they are doing uh, right by those standards. Um, there's no real state um, incentive to self-regulate. So if we're left at the hands of states to get appraisals, appraiser industries to move forward, and evolve, well, we're gonna be dealing with the same kind of situation for another 150 years. If we wanna fast forward to what it should be right now, we've gotta get more federal teeth in enforcement. And we can't wait for administrations to change 
to actually make affirmatively furthering fair housing real. And then four years later, it's not real again. And the states uh, just don't have any incentive to self-regulate to even take a look at what appraisals are going on. So one of the things I will have to raise my hand and say is that there has to be uh, intervention on the behalf of um, homeowners or people who are trying to buy or sell homes that, hey, maybe we can just push a button on the CFPB and says, hey, I got an appraisers here in the state of Missouri, and I want to see how many other people have been dealing with this same issue. And if you don't do anything else, at least track how many complaints there are, and so that we can publicly see what's going on with these different uh, appraisals. And then, and and the greatest amount would be actually have some enforcement uh, activity that would happen. You know, so that I, I definitely want to put pull that up that we can't just wait for the states to self-regulate because there's no incentive for them to do so. I would, I'd love to jump in and just quickly say <clears throat> one more thing, which is, I mean, I want to echo what Lisa Rice said about having the resources for enforcement as well as, as, as for consumer education. In one of our cases, um, the homeowner who made a complaint was an appraiser and so was very savvy compared to the average consumer. And we're finding that in general, the, the clients who come to us, who know to come to us, are in fact pretty savvy about, um, about the whole process. I also think there's a need to think about how complaints of race discrimination in the appraisal process will be enforced. Um, there tends to be, I think, a reliance in, in proving that racial bias occurred on comparing two different appraisals. One uh, where in the first, the race of the homeowner is apparently black and the other where it's apparently white, where the black homeowner has had to, as we've talked about, um, which is has, has disappeared or erased their race and their culture from their home. I know that Jim uh, and others talked about how heartbreaking this is. And I know, you know, many people have expressed to me how deeply offensive this is. So we need to have a different, di some different standards, I think, about um, how we judge evidence in these types of cases. Thanks for that. Ms. Nelson, do you want to go quickly and then I'll pass it back to Patrice? Yes, building on what my fair housing colleagues said as well, this is the most important asset most of us have. It should not be in the hands of a single person's opinion. So what Lisa was talking about in order to get rid of the art, make it more science, that's so important. We talked about earlier, transparency and public data, maybe a HEMDA-like program where that public data is released to the public. So groups like mine can uncover discrimination like we do in lending. As part of that, we know the GSEs already have a lot of this particular data. Uh, addressing the bias in the comps, you know, do we need to look at a, a sort of reconstruction type cost value being used in the neighborhoods that have been historically redlined or suffer from that devaluation over time? And then uh, we need a more formalized appeal process. According to the appraisal industry, over 90% of uh, appraisal appeals are denied. And there needs to be an escalation in current times by lenders when bias or concerns or uh, a low value comes in that escalates that into a second appraisal. And maybe we have a tidewater type rule that applies across the appraisal industry rather than just under VA and the GSEs to allow people then to that they're not taking these hard credit hits by going through these appraisals and trying to get multiple appraisals. And I would say um, in an additional that in appraisal documents, not only the, the guidance that's already in there that talks about that racial bias cannot play a role, but something that is handed out that directs them to HUD, to CFPB, to their local fair housing center so that they can get more information assistance in navigating a very difficult enforcement process. Thank you, Ms. Nelson. Uh, and Patrice, back to you for the next question. All righty. Thank you so much, Acting Director Wei What a great discussion. Um, I don't, I'm not sure, uh, did Megan um, Haberly get a chance to weigh in? Because um, I couldn't recall if we had heard from LDF yet. I just wanted to make sure yeah. that we give her a chance to weigh in on any of the many topics that we have uh, <laughs> uh, have talked about. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, and, you know, thank you again um, to the CFPB staff and all of the policymakers here who are here and also to my fellow advocates. Um, I have, you know, I have a deep background in fair housing and, and to an extent fair lending, less so in appraisals specifically. Um, so I think I'm learning a lot here today, which I really appreciate. Um, I want to speak, um, you know, to amplify a couple of the points that have been made. Um, one is to the enforcement point, and I really appreciate the fact that, you know, we're addressing this problem on multiple levels. We're calling out, you know, the cultural issues within the profession, the need to, you know, diversify representation, 
the need to instill training, anti-bias training throughout the profession. Um, but I would really in particular amplify the focus on enforcement in particular. Um, you know, we do have a lot of unintentional bias in our country. We also do have a lot of very deep structural racism that is going to, you know, take a lot, a lot of resources um, to overcome. And I think to the point where, you know, you are putting an emotional burden on individual households, individual plaintiffs um, to bring these kinds of complaints. I I would really speak specifically to the importance, you know, of testing resources, audit resources, um, things like that that are really putting, you know, the resources and also the burden on, you know, entities that are set up to bring these kinds of cases and complaints and this kind of systemic oversight to bear, um, rather than putting the burden on individual households necessarily to recognize what's going on and carve out time to, uh, to challenge it. Um, I would also speak to the point that, um, you know, often in enforcement culture or litigation culture, we're very focused on, um, you know, the notion of similarly situated households and whether there's disparate treatment of those households. And I think we have to give a really, you know, hard query to what that means when we're dealing with, um, you know, issues of systemic racism and segregation and differences among neighborhoods in particular. Um, and so that points to the need to think, you know, very creatively, I think, about how we're pushing the appraisal industry to think about these things. Um, you know, just by way of analog, I know that there have been a lot of conversations happening, um, you know, in the realty industry, um, you know, that are somewhat along a similar theme. So how do you sort of look outside of, um, you know, the racialized devaluation of these neighborhoods to some of the upstream factors or some of the biases that might be taking place outside the corners of the transaction. So for example, you're looking at the way that school diversity is perceived. Is that perceived as an asset when someone is going in and buying a home? Are they just looking at a score that's based on test scores, uh, test scores of a school? Um, you know, so I think at looking at um, aspects of the ecosystem uh, like that, you know, is going to be especially important, um, you know, which maybe gets back to the, the research question that was posed in the beginning. That's very helpful. Thank you so much for that perspective um, from the Legal Defense Fund. Um, you know, I, I'm mindful of time um, and goodness, we had so many questions <laughs> that we generated. Um, but I'm going to pivot to the very same question that Acting Director Hui Jiu asked um, of our um, sister agencies, um, the, the agency heads that we were honored to have here as part of that federal panel, um, and ask um, um, each of you to just take a moment to um, just, you know, in, kind of at a high level, if you can, because I know there's a lot you probably want to share. But, but, but where, would you, uh, where would you recommend the, the Bureau to start? Um, as we try to help do our part um, in terms of moving um, more towards science than art, um, recognizing that there are some potential challenges with science. So some folks have talked a little bit about, you know, algorithmic, al algorithmic bias as a potential challenge. Um, and also recognizing that the Bureau does not have Fair Housing Act authority. We do have Equal Credit Opportunity Act authority. Um, and we do have an important role to play with regard to non-banks and, and other aspects where we can make a difference. Um, but just given that, um, and I know folks have talked a little bit about testing, a little bit about data, but I did um, want to spend some time now just giving each of you an opportunity um, to chime in and just um, say kind of what you think the Bureau might do, um, you know, um, in terms of, of really helping to advance the ball um, with regard to, um, to these issues. Um, so why don't we start, um, why don't I start with Ms. Bailey, who serves um, on our consumer advisory board. So we have the benefit of her advising us often. I'll start with her. Uh, and then in between, I'll just rattle off a, a different organization and try to get to everyone so that you guys don't feel like you're all jumping in at the same time. Uh, but Ms. Bailey, can we start with you? Sure. One, one of the things that I think we really need to focus on is the cumulative impact of all of these things together. We often talk about discrimination as separate incidences, but they're, they're all really, um, taken together and impact consumers in a cumulative manner. And I have to stress the anti-Black bias um, portion of this. This Black tax is something that um, we know in communities is a fearful factor, right? Fear is keeping people in the rental market. Fear is making people avoid the homeownership space. So those two points for me 
would be really critical. And I think the borough could do more around amplifying the, the experience of of black consumers and other consumers of color to kind of get at that fear factor to help people understand what should actually happen. What does justice actually look like? Thank you so much, Mr. Jordan. There we go. And I think I, I completely agree with the remarks that were just said by um, Ms. Bailey uh, for certain that this has gone on for a long time. And uh, I think that really the CFPB. Um, I noticed that most of the people that I do refer to the CFPB, they enjoy the idea that they can interface and uh, uh, get on the computer and actually log in their complaint and know that something's going to be done with it. If nothing else, it's going to be there for time memorial about what experience I had with this bank. That's a big deal, believe it or not. That's a big deal that somebody heard me and now this is a part of a record that may be accumulated later on for us to really see what's going on. I think being able to do that in this space, right? Being able to have an opportunity to go through and not just be educated by the site that you feel is unbiased because it doesn't know you. It's just a computer that's got information that's relevant to what you're going through right now. And then also to be able to put down on that space, um, so to speak, uh, to whistleblow. It's a, it's a great whistleblower site when you feel as if maybe there's, you don't know who to trust. You don't know who's all who's all gonna benefit from your burden right now, but you do feel as if the CFPB serves as this, uh, this referee that is far enough removed from the process to not necessarily benefit from it, but definitely is interested in making certain that it goes in your favor. So I, I, I just love the idea that people can get on the computer and be able to instantly right now with one site to let somebody know what just happened to them and to have the possibility somebody else could actually see that they weren't the only one. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Nelson? We, of course, need to fix the decade upon decade of wrongs and trying to deal with that. So I read a great paper recently about the use of SBCBs that you know possibly could be a highlight as part of that. But I'd mentioned before, how do we go about changing, uh, adjusting values, potentially through a reconstruction type thing, but we need to make sure that that doesn't cause displacement, particularly by homeowners of color who were in those neighborhoods. So uh, property tax type programs, uh, property tax relief, uh, uh, homeowner repair type programs. Uh, a, I push for this quite often, uh, a, low a low dollar mortgage product for those $50,000 and under homes. If there's any guidance, a white paper, policy paper, CFPB could issue incentivize uh, something like that so that uh, more individuals can become homeowners uh, through that uh, particular process. And then uh, you know, we need to also um, have a national discussion about issues around housing reparations. We've seen some cities starting to discuss that, but it needs to be more robust and, and talk about because we need to write these wrongs that for decades have lost, have resulted in so much lost wealth for so many, while so many others of us benefited at the same time. It's a long history, isn't it? Uh, Mr. Diaz. Thank you. Um, I, I, I'm not sure this would be within CFPB's uh, framework, but uh, creating more distance between the lender and the appraiser um, might be helpful. And by that, I mean, um, like, rather than they all create their appraiser list that, they're, that meet their criteria, uh, as we found out, their state list of qualified appraisers and opening that selection process to a broader list, that's not totally captured by the bank. Or alternatively, um, having the buyer slash and realtor representative be able to recommend an appraiser for the property, just like they do title companies. Um, and so I just think adjusting those transactional levels may, I, I don't think it'll address the systemic things we've been talking here, but at least it will provide a, create a little space where uh, the value transaction can be a little bit more dem democratic. Thank you, um, Mr. Richardson. position of, you know, the pre-existing condition of being Black, usually within the health context, but here it's within the wealth context. I do think 
that there was low-hanging fruit around a consumer-facing campaign that designed to kind of demystify, detangle, and really kind of up, uplift communities, um, the hotline as well, um, with our with an articulated theory of change, much like Todd Harper mentioned, those are the component parts that can narrow the racial wealth gap. Absent that, the economic life chances of white and black America race away at light speeds. I do think a, a community, you know, this issue is regulated federally, but understood and the suffering happens locally. And I do think local outreach, economic reconciliation conversations with trusted nonprofit partners, collateral materials, bus stops, billboards to let folks understand and socialize the issue. Along with the data, we need to bring a consumer facing skin in the game, the outcome of this public policy challenge. Again, the Urban League's well, ready, willing, and able to, to work with you. Mm, bringing us back to the consumer aspect. Thank you. Um, Ms. Rice. Sure. You know, Patrice, I think um, one of the incredible things that the Bureau does is provide training uh, and different forums for stakeholders, lenders, et cetera, to talk about issues. So I do think that the Bureau can sponsor more training and educational events for appraisers, for lenders, and other stakeholders. Um, the other thing I'll lift up, Patrice, is that, um, you know, Amy actually alluded to this, that over 90% of the time when a consumer requests uh, an appraisal review, it is denied. So I think the Bureau could go uh, um, a long way to providing more guidance to lenders about what they should do when a consumer registers a complaint of appraisal bias um, and even working with HUD in terms of developing that guidance. Um, of course, you know I'm going to say that I, I, I think the CFPB can work with stakeholders to help de-bias automated uh, valuation models. Um, and then uh, the last thing I'll lift up is um, encouraging the CFPB to broaden uh, its uh, oversight when conducting fair lending evaluations, you know, really doing a deep dive into how uh, lenders are, uh, um, the processes that they have set up for appraisals and what they're doing to effectively address this, this issue. Uh, thanks so much, Lisa. You'll be pleased to know that in May, we actually delivered a training on the Equal Credit Opportunity Act at the spring conference of the Association of Appraiser Regulatory Officials. So we are off to the races on our education campaign. Um, Ms. Uh, Petey, thank you. Thank you. Um, well, it, it's it's great to go toward the end because everybody else steals your thunder and says all the things that you think that you wanted to say. But I'll just I'll say say that um, it's important to have clarity about what the Bureau's process will be to handle complaints that come in. Um, and if people believe that they have experienced race discrimination uh, in the appraisal process and file a complaint with the CFPB, you know, what will the, the CFPB to, to, uh, do to, to, to investigate, I think, or, or, or address it in some way? I think just being clear about what that is, what the potential remedies could be that the CFPB offer to home buyers encountering race discrimination in the appraisal process. Um, we do uh, refer um, people to the CFPB uh, for um, when we're working with uh, foreclosure clients, um, and we've had some great outcomes. Um, I also um, would say that I think it's important to bring together different groups uh, working on this issue as you're doing to, here today, uh, for which I'm very grateful. So uh, that there's co coordination and uh, uh, groups are working in silos. So thank you. Really oh, that's so true. Coordination. And we talked about it at the regulatory level as well. Um, Ms. Haberly. Yeah, I, I would uh, lift up one point that I think maybe hasn't been raised, which is to make sure sure that, um, you know, these efforts are reaching a diversity of communities, uh, rural communities, manufactured home communities, um, as well as the urban communities where, you know, a lot of the redlining that we've referred to um, has taken place. And, um, you know, speaking to the point that was raised about sort of getting at the disinvestment aspect that is impacting those neighborhoods and also impacting uh, home values, um, you know, the need for, um, I think, a government-wide effort um, and to work with sister agencies uh, to bring the resources that are needed into those neighborhoods. Um, and so often we look at housing redevelopment as sort of the low-hanging fruit of the resources that can be brought in from government actors, um, you know, but we don't want to go about that in ways that is amplifying or concentrating 
the already concentrated poverty um, that is there in those neighborhoods. Um, you know, it speaks to the point to bring in non-housing resources. Um, so using the tools that the federal government has as well as state governments, um, you know, looking at LATAC pro program design, looking at the Community Reinvestment Act um, and wielding that as powerfully as we can, um, and really making sure that we're sort of getting at this problem, you know, from all sides. That's great. That's great. Now, Mr. Pizer, I know that you were so eager to talk that you jumped up when the federal regulatory panel was going on. And so I'm going to let you bring us home with the last set of comments. So take it away. <laughs> Sorry, I was just so eager and it was just your perfect opportunity to jump in. But um, on the subject of the federal regulators and coordination, um, it would be great if the Bureau could work with the other agencies and maybe do a convening of um, mortgage lenders and ask, you know, why aren't you making loans at this dollar value or in these areas? You know, not, not an attack on them, but just we want to understand how your industry works, why aren't these loans being made, and what can be changed, what incentives would help you make them? And I think that would really, you know, meet the market at, you know, take it at face value and what do they need? They, what, are, what are the barriers and um, how can they be removed? What incentives? Uh, ECOA can be used to leverage that, fair housing, Humda data. Um, across the agencies, you put them all together, you've got that, that jurisdiction and the tools and ask the lenders what they need. That's excellent. Well, they say that a journey of a thousand miles begins with the first step. And I just feel like this has been a wonderful first step. Um, so let me offer my thanks and then turn it over to uh, my boss, Acting Director uh, Wei Jiu. <laughs> Patrice, I'm sorry, this is Lisa. I'm sorry, I neglected to say something. As just a resource, if folks are interested, um, if you visit our website at the National Fair Housing Alliance, you can see the uh, comments that we submitted to the Federal Housing Finance Agency in response to its request for information on appraisal bias issues. So that's on our website. Just wanted to let people know that resource was there. Thanks so much, Ms. Rice. Uh, back to you, Acting Director Wei Jiu. Great. Well, thank you all for this wonderful discussion today. Obviously, addressing the inequities and the persistent bias in all aspects of consumer finance has been one of my core priorities for the CFPB. And conversations like these today really help bring these issues right out into the sunlight. As the Bureau and our partner agencies engage on this topic in the coming months, we will consider today's discussion in our efforts to find appropriate remedies to appraisal bias. I'd like to conclude on a personal note. This may be one of the last times I'm providing remarks as acting director of the CFPB, though the timing is ultimately left up to the Senate. It's been such an honor to lead the agency I've called home for the last nine years. I came to the federal government because I believe the public sector can be an overwhelming force for good. I was incredibly fortunate to come to a startup agency like the CFPB, which has had a measurable impact in improving the lives of everyday Americans. But there is still so much work to do and so many consumers facing financial inequity and hardship that need our help. Thank you to all the roundtable participants and government partners who helped make this event possible. I'll now turn it over to Chairman Harper for any closing, closing thoughts he'd like to provide. Uh, Dave, uh, first of all, thank you for working to organize today's event and everybody at CFPB <clears throat> for making it happen. And thank you to everyone who participated. This was truly a thought provoking uh, discussion. Your comments right there at the end are, are at the core of this. You know, government can be a tool like a hammer. Uh, as Molly Ivins once said, you can use it to build with or you can use it to destroy with. How good government is depends on how you use it and what you use it for. And, and right now we have an opportunity to use it judiciously to address problems of appraisal bias, to address problems uh, that have been in our system with respect to the wealth gap, with respect to home ownership gaps, with respect to so much more. And we need to take this opportunity and use government smartly to address the problems. I know we at the NCUA are going to continue to stay focused uh, on the issue of appraisal valuation services and what further reforms. And I'm going to continue to be looking at economic equity and justice in my seat and role as the FFIEC chairman. I'm ready to roll my sleeves and act, and I'm looking forward to working with all of you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Chairman Harper, for your remarks. And many thanks to all of our participants for making today's event a success and for the members of the public who tuned in today. Again, as we mentioned at the top, today's event um, has been recorded and we intend to post the recording to our website in the coming weeks. This concludes today's event on home appraisal bias. I hope you all have a wonderful day. Thank you so much. 
Thanks, everybody.